language interpreters for providing their service uh, again this week. Our Spanish language simulcast is available on the Monroe County Communications YouTube uh, channel. So uh, we'll start like we usually do, just to go over the, uh, the metrics and where we are and the trends that we're seeing. Um, you know, obviously we talked about the surge in new cases that we had uh, back, uh, uh, back in uh, March and April, but we've seen a plateau of new cases and our seven-day positivity rate over the last couple of weeks. While our metrics remain higher than other parts of the state, we're not seeing a substantial increase uh, over the past period of time of several weeks. Our highest case totals continue to be from the same age demographics, uh, 10 to nine-year-olds, residents in their 20s and in their 30s. From yesterday's COVID-19 report, we had 18 cases under 10 years old, 23 cases of residents 10 to 19, 40 cases of people in their 20s, and 29 cases of residents in their 30s. Compared to our last briefing two weeks ago, however, those numbers are trending downward slightly, an encouraging sign that more people are getting vaccinated and still taking precautions. Our local positivity rates at 3.1% as of yesterday and has been holding steady in that range for the last several weeks. For comparison, last week's reported seven day average was 2.9. Our new daily cases have also declined over the last two weeks, but still remain higher than we'd like. We reported 179 new cases yesterday and a seven day average of new cases was 193, which is an improvement from last week when we were at 209. Hospitalizations in ICU also continue to hold steady as well with yesterday's report having 219 in the hospital and 51 in the ICU. At our briefing last week, we had reported 215 uh, in the hospital and 46 in ICU. So as you can tell, the numbers are really just holding steady at this point. Vaccination efforts continue to move along uh, steadily. According to the state vaccine dashboard, 333,000 Monroe County residents have completed their vaccination series. During the briefing last week, we reported 301,000 that had completed. So that's a significant increase uh, week over week. Additionally, 388,000 or 52.4% have received at least their first uh, dose of vaccine. This is above the state average, which is at 48.8. Additionally, 64.9% of Monroe County residents 18 years age or older have at least one dose of the vaccine. I think that's a significant number that we have here. It's 64.9% of residents 18 and older have at least one dose of the vaccine. Obviously, the big news of the week this week is that the FDA, the CDC, and New York State have endorsed the usage of Pfizer vaccine on residents 12 to 15 years old. Our vaccination team in the Department of Public Health, we've been preparing for this uh, for some time now, which has helped us to be in a position to begin the process immediately. We anticipate this is going to have a significant impact on slowing the spread in our community as it reaches into more of the age demographic that we see experiencing the most significant number of cases uh, day to day. As of today, all Monroe County operated locations are offering the Pfizer vaccine and will be accepting 12 to 15 year old residents with parental and, guard, and guardian consent. This has began this morning at our pop-up pods and will continue uh, into the future. This is especially timing as we begin the new phase of vaccine distribution, which includes the partnerships with so many local school districts and community centers. As we continue to roll out the pop-up locations in an effort to bring the vaccine closer where people live and making it more convenient, we do have a, a new exciting partnership uh, to announce today. In addition to our other pop-up locations and partnerships, today we're announcing in partnership with the YMCA of Greater Rochester, we're holding a series of pop-up clinics at YMCA locations throughout the county. Westside Family YMCA on Elm Grove Road in Gates will be Tuesday, May 18th from one to seven. Southwest Family YMCA on Thurston Road in Rochester will be Tuesday, May 25th from 10 to four. Eastside Family YMCA, on Fairport Nine Mile Point Road in Penfield will be Tuesday, June 1st from 1 to 7. And the Shotland Family YMCA on West Jefferson Road in Pittsford will be on Monday, June 7th from 1 to 7. The good news is that all these clinics will offer the Pfizer vaccine. So any uh, ages 12 and older will be able to get vaccinated uh, uh, at one of these four YMCA locations. Uh, you can make an appointment to get vaccinated at the YMCA by calling our COVID-19 hotline at 753-5555, or you can go to the Monroe County website at monroecounty.gov and make an appointment there. All of these locations, as with every Monroe County sponsored pop-up, is also accepting uh, walk-ins. <clears throat> as I said last week, we're also uh, working with other locations and partners 
and hope to finalize those details in the coming days. Uh, but we're continuously working and really grateful for all our community partners for working with us to bring more and more pop-up vaccine locations uh, into neighborhoods where people live. And re another reminder is that these are also on top of the Convention Center and Fleet Center, which remain constant vaccination distribution centers. So while the pop-up locations may move around the county day to day, uh, we do have constant uh, vaccine supply at the convention center and at the county fleet center. Again, you can make those appointments online or uh, obviously they accept walk-ins as well. Homebound uh, earlier this week, we also announced a community partnership with the Vaccine Hub, Lifespan, Goodwill of, of the Finger Lakes, uh, the Finger Lakes Performing Provider System and our local emergency medical agencies to provide vaccination to homebound individuals in Monroe County and the nine county Finger Lakes region. Homebound individuals or their caregivers can call the COVID-19 hotline, which is being staffed by 211 uh, Lifeline and is creating a referral list for those who need to be vaccinated but are unable to visit one of our vaccination clinics. All individuals have to do, whether you are an individual who is at home and can't uh, get to a clinic or if you're a caregiver, simply call our hotline, again, at 753-5555 and we will connect a vaccinator to you who can come to your home and your place of residence to deliver the vaccine. The program is designed from the perspective of the homebound patient and their caregivers, utilizing the COVID-19 vaccine hotline to support homebound residents and give them the point of contact to request a COVID-19 vaccine. Partnering with emergency medical service agencies in our community is a win-win with their unique perspective and relationship to the people in the community that they serve. And so I wanna thank them for their partnership in bringing the vaccine as close to someone's home as you possibly can. Lastly, before I turn it over to Dr. Mendoza, I wanna remind people, we do have the pop-up clinic at the Lilac Festival this Saturday and Sunday. It runs from 10.30 to five o'clock. Again, that's in a partnership with Common Ground Health and, uh, and the VA. Um, and so we'd like to, again, encourage folks who are attending the Lilac Festival this weekend, please stop by the tent between 10.30 and 5 p.m and you can receive a vaccination right at the Lilac Festival. The weather is supposed to be beautiful this weekend, so if you and your family are able to make it out, enjoy the beautiful lilacs, the arts and crafts, and I encourage you to stop by. Uh, we'll have vaccinators on hand, but we'll also have ambassadors uh, that you've heard about in these briefings from Common Ground Health there to answer any questions that anybody might have. This is really a great opportunity and partnership. And again, as we see the Pfizer vaccine being made available, to 12 to 15 year olds in our community expansion. I really do encourage uh, parents throughout the community have conversations with pediatricians, with medical professionals about the vaccine and about the appropriateness of the vaccine for your children. As we continue to see our vaccination numbers increase and the percentages increase, we will see our cases decrease and we'll get back to that sense of normal. I'm so delighted to see so many festivals and outdoor activities starting to happen again. And it's because we're vaccinated and because we know being outside is safe. So we wanna to work together to continue that trend. So as we go through the summer, we can do more and more things that we know Monroe County is known for and that we've all been looking forward to. And that's all those outdoor events uh, and festivals and fairs. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mendoza. Thank you, County Executive Bellow, and good afternoon to members of the media and to those who are watching us here today. Earlier this week, several colleagues and I discussed the importance of getting your child vaccinated against COVID-19 as soon as he or she is eligible. Now that Pfizer has been approved for children as young as 12 years old, many more kids are able to be vaccinated. There are a lot of reasons these children should get vaccinated as soon as possible, but I want to discuss one in particular because it is close to my heart. Our adolescents have suffered over the last 15 months. Their mental health and emotional well being have been threatened by the inability to freely socialize with their friends and their classmates. They have not been able to play the sports they love to play. They have missed out on birthday celebrations and slumber parties. And while every family's experience is a little different, there is no question that our adolescents have had their lives turned upside down by this pandemic. Today, we are starting to turn it right side up again. As soon as our adolescents are fully vaccinated, they'll be able to safely take off their masks around their vaccinated friends. They'll be able to safely gather for parties at clubs and for late night pizza. This vaccine is an opportunity to help our adolescents begin to feel a sense of normalcy that has been lost to COVID-19. It will help to restore their mental and emotional well-being. I know many parents have questions, but I assure you there are good answers to all of them. 
I encourage parents of children 12 years and up to discuss your concerns with your healthcare provider. Then please take your children to get vaccinated. I also wanna take a moment to discuss something of importance to parents of young children, particularly those enrolled in childcare programs. As allergy season has started here in Monroe County, parents are seeing a lot more sniffles, sneezes, and coughs. Please though, do not dismiss the possibility, however, that these sniffles, sneezes, and coughs may actually be symptoms of COVID-19, not simply the seasonal allergies. We are seeing a concerning increase in the number of positive COVID-19 cases involving childcare programs in Monroe County, both among children and among staff. In March, the number of cases involving childcare programs was 56. That more than doubled in the month of April when we recorded 133 cases. In the first week of May alone, we have counted 65 cases, more than the entire month of March combined. I have sent a communication to childcare providers asking them to review the existing New York State guidance and to pay special attention to mask wearing and physical distancing in their facilities. I have asked them to double down on their screening efforts to make sure any child or staff member who has symptoms is staying at home. And I'm asking parents to be vigilant as well. If your child has new or worsening symptoms that could be COVID-19, please do not send him or her to daycare and please call your healthcare provider instead. Uh, with that, I will turn things back over to Julie and be happy to field your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Mendoza. First up is Jane Chaco from 13 WAM. Hi. First, I wanted to ask about the um, CDC to announce that vaccinated people don't have to wear masks in crowds outside. I'm sure you heard about it and also about easing restrictions for them indoors. Dr. Mendoza, I just wanted to know what your thoughts, I know the decision is up to the governor, but um, yeah, your thoughts. I think this makes good sense. I think this underscores the efficacy and the safety of the vaccine. It underscores that now, you know, a good part through the vaccination program, we are seeing the benefits of the vaccine. Uh, in terms of uh, what we're learning about transmission, as well as the decrease in cases among people uh, who are vaccinated. So I think this makes good sense. Um, we obviously have to wait and see what the guidance ultimately says, but anywhere we have the authority to uh, begin to follow the CDC guidelines, we're gonna try to do that because I think uh, we all share the, de the desire as a community to get out there uh, and to get rid of the masks whenever it's uh, safe and, and effective to do so. So I think this is yet another uh, step in the right direction toward that uh, uh, you know, sense of normalcy that we all want. Um, and I think it's also a reminder that there are still a lot of people who have not yet gotten their vaccine. And we wanna do everything we can as a community to help all of those people find a way that's comfortable, that's convenient, that's safe, so that they feel like they can get the vaccine and uh, reap all the same benefits that those who do have the vaccine uh, can also enjoy. Thank you. And my question, second question is about um, schools. Does the county plan on educating families about the vaccination clinics that are, help, that are going to be held at school districts? Oh, sure. We, uh, so we're partnering with those school districts to do those. So those are uh, partnerships between the county and the school districts um, who are reaching out to families in their community, in their school community, but also uh, uh, we here at the county are advertising those countywide as well. They're free, they're free uh, and open. Uh, to the full community, just because you're, they're located at a school does not mean um, that it's only open uh, to the school community. So we really wanna make sure that, uh, that we, we get this information out there. Um, but we thought schools were a great place where they made sense because as we start to open up to younger people being eligible, um, uh, it makes sense to go where people are comfortable and used to going in places where, where you know where you're going and, and where you are. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's, I, I thought it was a really great partnership to use. And also, frankly, when you're looking at graduations and proms coming up, um, doing them school-based clinics like this makes a lot of sense uh, so we can get as many people vaccinated as possible so we can, we can get back to uh, also utilizing that new CDC guidance that came out hopefully uh, when New York State updates theirs. Thank you, Jane. Next is Andrew Freeman from Spectrum News. Hi, uh, how are you guys doing? Uh, I just wanted to maybe, and, and I think either of you could take this, um, but I just wanted to, we've now seen one weekend of the Lilac Festival, kind of our first, um, you know, tip, dipping our toes in, in, in these, you know, in this kind of, you know, returning to this world. I was just wondering how you guys thought that went and, um, you know, you know, hopes for, 
you know, these coming weekends in nicer weather. I thought the uh, first weekend of the Lilac Festival was a smashing success. And uh, I am just so proud of the team that was there vaccinating. But I'm also just proud of the community for coming out, recognizing being outdoors and being part of the community is safe to do. Uh, we see the CDC is underlying that now today too with their new guidance. Uh, I was also delighted to be with the Fairport Canal Days yesterday announcing their festival that's coming up in a few weeks. I think uh, that you know when the guidance has been clear for a long time, that being outside, once you're vaccinated, it's a, it's a safe activity. And these festival fairs, these are what we need to do. We've been without festivals and, and community like that for, for a long time. And so we need some good news. We need to get back to that sense of normal. And that's what these festivals and outdoor activities represent. So that's why we're happy to work with any festival organizer. We work with a number of them, just like we did with Fair Pro Canal Days, uh, to try to make these happen and help them meet the guidelines. And uh, we want to continue to do that. We recognize the challenges that go into planning events like that, uh, because oftentimes you need a, lot, a long uh, runway there to hire vendors. And sometimes there's uh, uh, financial outlays that need to be made uh, that, that are difficult to recover if the event can't go off. Uh, but I think that, you know, folks like here at the Lilac Festival, also the Fairport Canal Days, have proven if you can get creative. Uh, and uh, th there is a way to follow these guidelines and to do these outdoor events. And I really do encourage folks to participate, uh, and follow the guidelines, uh, but let's get outside and let's, uh, let's celebrate okay. summer and spring and get back to normal. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, my, my next question is about the um, recently the New York State Department of Health talked um, to local um, departments of health about you know, schools reopening and how that might look like with cohorts and, and what defines a cohort. Um, I, I was wondering, Dr. Mendoza, if you could talk about, you know, how cohorts might look and, and how students might be grouped up come, um, you know, this upcoming fall, especially with now 12 and 15 year olds being able to be vaccinated. Well, so let's go back to the history of why cohorts uh, exist in terms of, uh, you know, disease uh, investigations. The reason for cohorting is to try to keep a, a boundary, if you will, around a fixed number of people. So in the event that you need to do contact tracing or quarantine, you can limit the number of people that need to be uh, quarantined. Um, cohorting was never intended as a way to mitigate risk from a transmission standpoint. And so um, the CDC has sort of borrowed from that uh, knowledge to try to define what a cohort is. But if you look at the CDC guidelines and if you look at the state guidelines, nowhere in there is there a defi definition of what a cohort is. So without a number, I've been working with the school districts to see if we can define a cohort. And you know, if you think of a, a cohort, many of our you know, seventh and eighth grade uh, class, uh, classes have uh, houses or, or, or teams. And those teams, you know, break up an eighth grade, for example, into three groups of, say, 100 apiece. Well, even within that 100, you know, you could argue that cohort of 100 is kind of large. And when you quarantine a whole 100 uh, group of kids, that's, you know, more than you'd ever want to quarantine. But if you look at an individual child in that cohort of 100, they're probably not interacting with more than half, if not even half of that group of 100. So we're looking for ways to creatively define a cohort and um, working with a number of schools who have uh, done just that. And they have opened seventh and eighth grade or have plans to do so um, with the understanding that, you know, if we need to quarantine, we will have to, but the hope is that we won't have to. And now that uh, many of these children are eligible to get vaccinated, I think the need to quarantine is even lower. So uh, I think all of this points to the fact that this coming fall, assuming that we continue at the same clip that we're on right now, we're going to be seeing a, a lot more normal of a school year uh, come, come this fall. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Patty Singer from Minority Reporter. Thank you. I see the county executive is back on the disabled list. It's I am. <laughs> I had it on last week. It just blended in. <laughs> uh, injured, <laughs> injured reserve. Injured reserve. Yeah, injured reserve. got expanded, right? Dr. Mendoza, so it looks like the ICU numbers are the highest that they have been in since the uh, middle of late April. What are the ages of that and how concerning is that? Not so much from a bed standpoint, because I saw some data that shows we have lots of capacity, but these are high ICU numbers. What's happening with that? 
Well, Patty, I don't have the numbers uh, or the demographics of that uh, population uh, at my fingertips, but I can tell you that they're all unvaccinated people. And as, as much as, as we've enjoyed a fair amount of success vaccinating people in our community, there's still a lot of people who are not vaccinated. And if you're not vaccinated and you get COVID-19, the, then it's essentially 2020 for you. You know, we are in the same boat that we have been uh, from the standpoint of the patient, uh, having to do what we can to keep that person alive and bring them back to good health. So I think the underlying message here is while we're not concerned about hospital capacity like we were earlier this year or certainly like we were uh, last year, um, we still want to look out for the health of our community. And if you haven't been vaccinated, uh, you have a much higher chance of being hospitalized if you get COVID and having other complications. So the demographics of the people in the hospital are people who are not vaccinated. And so uh, I think that's a wake up call uh, for all of us. Thankfully, uh, they're hanging on uh, thanks to the help of our nurses and doctors in the hospital, but um, we would much rather not to have to see them in the hospital at all. So uh, the message here is get vaccinated no matter what age you're at. So to, to, I guess along those same lines, I understand that there have been some inaccuracies in the data on active cases in the last period of time that we're not real sure about. But still, even if we went back a few weeks in, into, I guess, late April, we're still looking at potential of 2,500 to 3,000 active cases. How worrisome is that with variants around, with still vaccine hesitancy, to have even, uh, you know, two thirds of, of the number that were there now, to have somewhere around 3,000 cases, active cases. What, uh, what's the worry nature of that? So we're looking into that too, because, you know, somebody called that to my attention over the weekend, and we looked into that with the state. And uh, unbeknownst to all of us here, the state changed how they recorded uh, people who were cleared from isolation. And so that graph is, we're actually going to be looking at uh, pulling it down because the, the trend that was reflected on that graph is not accurate. So um, the number of active cases is far less than that. You know, we're seeing, you know, 100 to 200 cases a day. And then, you know, on average, 10 days later, they're off the list. So uh, it's nowhere near as high as that. So I apologize. That's, a, that's an error on the part of the website and, and, and us. All right. So there's still there's the need then for housing and things like that in the hotels. That's pretty much gone by the boards now that there's not much in demand for that. Yeah, there's a small amount of demand for that. You know, the, the people for whom that is a demand, it's a very important need. Uh, but thankfully, the, the, the sheer numbers aren't there. So, so we're able to manage that pretty readily. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Emily Putnam from WHEC is next. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everyone. Thanks, as always, for taking the time today to talk with us. Uh, this is for either County Executive Bellow or Dr. Mendoza. Um, there's been a lot of skepticism, specifically among young people, about the vaccine, uh, as you know. And I'm curious, what are some of the things that you're doing to incentivize teenagers to get it or to educate them um, to kind of undo some of the skepticism? Well, that's, you know, we hear that, the, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're choosing the partners that we're choosing. Uh, as the vaccine eligibility uh, continues to expand. Uh, once it expanded down uh, into teenagers and then now down to 12 years old, we have started partnering with organizations that we think are closest and trusted by those individuals who are eligible for the vaccine. That's how we started from the beginning when you're working with uh, folks. Remember initially it was um, older residents and uh, those in the healthcare industry. We're working with those industries to work with their employees and with those residents. And as you go down, we start partnering with organizations that make sense because they're trusted voices. So that, that's a big reason behind the partnership with the Bear with us, team. I think uh, we're uh, missing uh, Adam's audio feed here. I apologize for that. We'll uh, look into that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
That was a good answer I was giving, but let me just say this. So let me just start over because I don't know where it, where it, uh, where it, where it cut out. But let me, let me just say this. The, the strategy that we've been employing is as eligibility increases, So why don't I start with an answer while Adam's team gets it figured out. Um, you know, a lot has been said about this, this term hesitancy. Um, and I think we have this temptation to assume that the hesitant all look and sound the same. Um, but the reality is that the hesitant group isn't necessarily just hesitant about the vaccine. They may be looking for ways to get the vaccine in a way that's more convenient to them, in a way that's more comfortable to them. A lot of people have said, you know, they want to get the vaccine, but they don't want to do it in a large site. They want to do it in, you know, somewhere like the comfort of their school or their, their primary care doctor's office or a community setting where there isn't this large uh, floor of, of, you know, dozens of, of chairs and tables and people. Um, but uh, as the county executive was saying, we're working very closely with the schools. We're working very closely with community organizations, with the YMCA, uh, trying to meet people where they are. Um, and I think it's just a testament to how, you know, with every passing week in this vaccination program, we're learning something new. And I think if there was one thing that uh, I would have to uh, say to describe our efforts so far is that, uh, you know, we've had to adapt very quickly to a lot of changing circumstances. And, uh, you know, you're seeing it uh, today with the announcement of 12 to 15, we've seen a sur surge in numbers uh, today and tomorrow and over the weekend for 12 to 15 year olds. And I don't have any expectation that that's always going to continue. I think we're going to get to the point where we have 12 to 15 year olds who are truly uh, hesitant and have questions and concerns. And so we're encouraging them to go to their primary care doctor's office because we think that that's in general, uh, one of the safer places for people who have questions, a, a place where they have a relationship with somebody and uh, can have their concerns uh, addressed. Good answer. I'm back for the record. <laughs> we had a battery problem with my microphone, so hello. Do, okay. do you have anything to add before she goes to her second question, County Executive? No, I'm, no, that's, no that's where we were going. All right. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Do you have a follow-up, Emily? I do. Yes. Thank you both for your answers. Um, yeah. Regarding indoor masks, um, you know, I think it's possible that people might see that, that CD, the CDC is expected to loosen their mandates on masks and think, okay, well, I'm vaccinated. I don't need it anymore anywhere I go. Can you tell me, you know, how does it apply to people who are vaccinated today when they see these headlines? Does that mean that they can go out and lose the mask and leave it home? Or, you know, what, what's your recommendation for vaccinated people seeing the news from the CDC today? Well, I, I think we have to wait and see what the official news is, but quite honestly, the risk here is not to the people who are vaccinated, it's, it's to the people who are not. And, uh, you know, as the community starts to take their mask off, you know, if you're vaccinated and, um, you know, starts to resume that normal, it, it makes me think we've got to double down on our efforts to help those who are not yet vaccinated to understand the benefits of getting the vaccine. Um, because I think, unfortunately, they're the ones who stand to lose, given now that we're sort of entering this, this new phase of normal. So, um, you know, it gives me pause because I think about all the people that we haven't yet been able to reach, all the people who, who still have questions that I want to answer. Um, I think it, uh, it, it points to the reality that we have an even greater responsibility to our community uh, to help those who have questions and concerns and that so-called hesitancy uh, to resolve it in a way that makes uh, best sense for them and their family. Great. Thank you. Matthew Leonard from the Democrat and Chronicle is next. Hi, thanks everyone. I appreciate you doing this as, as always. Uh, Dr. Mendoza kind of presaged my question a little bit, which has had to do with the, um, the homebound, uh, reach, reaching people who are homebound with vaccination. Do you see the potential for expanding services to people who, you know, as you were saying, Dr. Mendoza may not be hesitant, but for lifestyle reasons or because they are caregivers or because of their circumstances with transport, just aren't, you know, aren't able to get to a vaccination site at this point? Have you identified any people, you know, that you might want to reach in different ways, you know, as you are the homebound? Absolutely. I mean, we, we have to find a way to do this. It's not, it's not an option. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a must. We've got to figure out how to do it. Um, the reality, unfortunately, is to, to visit every homebound person, to get the shot to them, to do so safely, uh, means that it's going to be a slow process. We'll, you know, at most have four people an hour because of the, the, the wait time for the current vaccines. So it's going to be a slog. It's going to take some time, but it's important for us to do it. And, uh, 
you know, this is underscoring the need for the collaboration that the county executive mentioned. We've got to work with other partners so that we can, you know, multiply the efforts that, uh, you know, we in the health department can't meet, uh, you know, all the demand on our own. But uh, I would say it's, it's, not, it's not optional. I think we have to figure out a way to do it. Thank you. I don't have a follow-up. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Our final question today comes from Raquel Steven of WXXI. Hello, good afternoon, guys. Um, my question is about um, kids, um, the new ex the age expansion. Um, I just, I guess what I'm trying to say is kids usually follow after their parents, right? So if a parent's not vaccinated, a kid probably won't get vaccinated. Um, so shouldn't the target outreach be for parents that are not vaccinated? Because I believe the kids will follow. And what if the kid does want to get vaccinated, but the parent is like, well, no, you're not getting vaccinated. How should that kid approach um, that situation? Well, we cannot vaccinate a child without their parents or guardians' consent. Uh, so that is, that is uh, you know, not negotiable. Um, but we want to encourage conversation. You know, I can imagine a, a circumstance where, uh, you know, children want to get the vaccine and may actually coach their parents to, to do it all together as a family. Uh, I wouldn't underestimate the, the power of our children in motivating good behavior among adults. Uh, you know, we see this all the time. Parents who, or sorry, children who encourage their parents to reconsider smoking or, you know, things of that sort. I mean, I think our, our children have a lot of wisdom. And, uh, you know, if they want to get vaccinated, I would encourage all adolescents to talk to your parents about it. Have that conversation, uh, you know, around the dinner table uh, tonight and in the coming, you know, days and weeks. Um, you know, now is the time to have that conversation because if we can get whole families vaccinated, just imagine the, the potential for, you know, summer activities, vacations, and the like. So I think, uh, you know, we're, we're turning a new page here, and uh, I really want to encourage everybody to have that conversation on the dinner table. Okay, so that's it for me, Julie. Thank you. All Is right, that that's our final question. Yeah. Yes, thank you, everybody. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.